Aloha and welcome to Plasma Apocalypse 101. I'm Jay Dreamers and uh, we've gone through an entire series now breaking down the individual elements of the Plasma Apocalypse. Let me just adjust my audio, make sure I'm not too loud here. Welcome everyone, it's good to see you all. Let me get the chat pulled up here and we will start with our presentation. Good to see you all. All right, so check this out. To all we're talking about the end of the world, or the the end of the world as we know it. And we've been talking about a theory that I'm sort of putting together um, and reevaluating that I call the plasma apocalypse. Basically, it's a cyclical resetting of life as we know it, all life as we know it. Um, geography gets changed around. Uh, Things get sucked up into the air. There's worldwide earthquakes. There's uh, zombies. There's a lot of different things that are a part of the plasma apocalypse. This series is dedicated to listing off each individual element, um, which there are many of. We're just covering the main ones. And we've started off with the cyclical nature of the apocalypse itself. Uh, we've moved on to the different types, one by water, one by fire. We went to, we went on and we talked about worldwide depressurization, how our world is pressurized and it needs to release that pressure every once in a while, which gives us our polarity shifts and the magnetic or electromagnetic dome or confinement dome or barrier uh, around our world goes down during that neutral point. When that barrier, that protective shield around our world goes down, that's when things get really interesting. Um, the red plasma comes down from above. Um, it's able to petrify things. It's able to uh, possibly reform or reshape uh, DNA or genetics. Um, there is liquefaction that happens. Things sink down into the earth itself. Things rise up out of the ground, out of the earth. The ground itself may be pulled up and petrified, creating new geological are geographic anomalies that modern science cannot seem to explain. So uh, I just wanted to sort of get to the main grand finale, the big show. The big show is all about waiting for all of that, the apocalypse, to be over so that we can start in a new age in, um, so that we can begin uh, life again, so that we can continue on and the good news is that whenever the, there's a, there is a, a signal, there's a sign that all will be able to see um, because it's something that um, everyone in the world will be able to see. And I believe that that sign is this light that we're going to be talking about that comes up from the earth itself. Now, what happens is light or energy is coming down, spiraling down on top of us, um, above us, coming from above us towards the ground. When we go through an energetic reversal or a polarity shift, that energy reverses. It goes into flux. It goes out all kinds of directions, and then it goes upwards instead of coming downwards. Uh, because the energy is now going up, it is coming up from the inside of our world and wrapping around our world, traveling upwards, going the other direction. That allows for the energy that is kept inside or underneath our world depending on your cosmology and how you'd like to see it, that causes that energy in the form of plasma and a strong electromagnetic currents to shoot up out of the earth. And that causes light that we see as sky beams or pillars of light. So what I'd like to do, oh, and hey, I, I want to say what's up to everybody in the chat too. 
I see Big Drink Tea. Hey, thanks thanks to you. I, I started researching distilled water, so appreciate that. Uh, Issa Mindset's in the chat and says, J Dreamers, there's lots of underground tunnels. Did people go underground during the apocalypse because of an atmosphere change? Possibly, possibly. We're going to talk about um, what lies underground. So let's do this. Let's start things off by trying to retrace the origins of the stories of this sky beam. Now, this is so prolific. I just want to throw this out there. This is so, this is, this is so evident in our pop culture that if you do a quick Google search on blue beams of light or sky beams and things of that nature, there are, there are entire web pages that are dedicated to this phenomenon, at least, at the very least, in the movies. There's other web pages that talk about it in real life. But in the movies, there's so many occurrences of giant, usually blue or light blue sky beams that people are starting to make YouTube videos about it. They're starting to make entire web pages dedicated to it. Some people are getting tired of seeing it in the movies because it happens so often. But that's the modern day. That's the cartoonification. That's what it's turned into. These are the ancient stories that we have passed along that have changed into what we call movies, right? So let's go back in time. Let's start at the beginning and talk about pillar cults. There are cults and there have been. There exist today cults, um, groups of people. Okay, I'm not trying to attribute evil just because it's a cult. But there have been cults that are known as pillar cults from ancient times. These cults, these cultures... Um, venerated the pillar. They venerated, and there's many different words that are interchangeable. You could use the word pillar. You could use the word column, towers, obelisks, poles, beams, trees, rods. And uh, these cults would erect these rods. They would put up these pillars and these beams, and they would be sacred beams, sacred pillars. They would be adorned differently. They would um, Sometimes they would be carved out so that you have little symbols on the uh, poles or on the pillars. Um, sometimes they would actually be made of different images. But one thing remains the same. Throughout history, going back as far as we can research, there are plenty of examples of these um, groups of people, religious or not, that seemed to worship a basic rod. And that rod, almost always from my research, is one that is coming up from the earth itself, shooting up so high that it touches the sky. So there have been, and it is a fact, that these cults have existed from time immemorial. Okay, uh, It is column worship. It is pillar worship. And there are many derivatives. There are many different symbols, and there's a lot of symbolism to this. Oftentimes I found that the people who are a part of these, um, these pillar cults will share that that uh, symbolism in the movies. Usually whenever the right before the movie even starts, they'll show you like a beam of light or something shooting up. So some of the symbolism is towers, obelisks, poles, beams, trees, rods. Um, there are God sticks. There are things called God sticks that um, certain tribes and uh, different peoples have venerated. They would create these sticks and they would call them the God sticks. Uh, there are also known as peace poles. So these rods and these poles are seen as deliverers of peace. Something that, something that is seen and evident to the people of the world that signifies that it is bringing about a change that is beneficial to mankind. It's a peace pole. They're also known as sacred trees. Um, the, best, the best example of that is the world tree, the tree of life, right? Which is also referred to as... Ceremonial poles, right? Like you may be familiar with the maypole, where people get their ribbons and they dance around a pole for some strange reason. When I was in high school, they actually allowed kids to leave class to go pray at the flagpole, and everyone would stand in a circle around it and pray at that particular pillar. Uh, let's see, we've got tribal world reeds. A reed is uh, basically a little stick a little plant that shoots right up out of the ground. Sometimes it's called a shoot. It's a reed that grows up out of uh, swampy ground and stuff. And uh, many tribal legends 
specifically Native American tribal legends, talk about this reed that grew up from the center of the world, grew so high that it pierced into the heavens and extended out into the next world. And there were certain people and animals that were able to climb up this world reed in order to get to the next world. And it always, always um, symbolized an apocalyptic event, essentially the ending of one world and the beginning of another one. Um, I also see the symbolism of the sword in the stone. I just want to double check the chat, make sure <laughs> everyone can hear me. Okay, cool. I'm totally not in the chat right now, but I will be. All right, uh, so the sword in the stone, okay? So this light, this blue light, usually I find that it's a bluish white light. Sometimes it's depicted as other colors, sometimes green or a greenish blue. But this, uh, this light shoots up from within the earth itself. Now, ancient legends and ancient stories indicate that those who have been able to traverse the inner world or the inner region of our world, the hollow portions of our world, the va vast cavernous openings that exist and do exist, it's not speculation. People have been there many times and they've written about it and they've come back from it and they've told stories and legends. Um, unfortunately, those stories have now become what we call fiction and fantasy and equate in modern vernacular to lies. But I find a lot of truth in this fiction. Uh, so yeah, this, this beam of light shoots up out of the plasma volcano or various uh, holy or sacred caves that exist that are really, um, there are multiple entrances and cave systems that connect and lead into the inner earth itself. So any place in the world where there's a cave system that extends and connects, no matter how large or how small, into the inner recesses of the earth has the potential to become one of these holy sacred caves where this light emits from, where it comes out of, essentially. Now there is one main hole, one main humongous entrance, according to these legends and myths across time, and that is at the North Pole. Um, there is an inner earth entrance up there, according to these legends, and it's gigantic. Uh, we're going to talk about that next up here. Uh, so we talked about the pillar cults, column worship, towers, obelisks, etc. Ceremonial poles, tribal world reeds, the sword that's in the stone. I believe the sword is in the stone, literally inside of it. Um, not one that's sticking out and needs to be pulled out, but one that is all already inside the stone. And the, the person that can bring it up out of the stone or out of the mountain uh, becomes king or king of the world, etc. Uh, let's see. It's also been seen as uh, the light of the world. There is a light. And because we live in this plane of existence, everyone across that plane can see the light, especially if it's located right in the middle of our world and it goes up and touches the sky. You can see it no matter where you are. It's also seen as the cruciform or the cross and many different other religious um, icons and symbols, right? Uh, I believe this is where we get our symbolism. This gets a lot. If you're interested in this subject, um, I would recommend studying the electric universe theories. Um, uh, the Thunderbolts Project is a great group of people who are dedicated to showing how plasma can be interchangeable with other anomalies and theories of how things were created in our world. It's also seen as Axis Mundi. It is the rod. It is the staff of the gods. It is this beam that shoots up and seems to be holding up the sky, keeping the sky from falling down onto the residents of, that live down below. It's also been seen as pillars of fire or fire from the heavens, or extending up into the heavens, a chariot of fire, a whirlwind of flame, etc. Light pillars. It's also known uh, as the eternal flame. Eternal, according to my studies, doesn't exactly always mean never ending. It just means um, it lasts so long that it lasts from one age, or one era, or eon, to the next. So that is the eternal flame that you don't want to go out. You don't want to allow that flame to go out. Why? Because as long as that blue beam is shooting up into the sky, that is a sign that everything's okay. That is a sign of peace. That is literally the peace sign, <laughs> right? Peace sign has like a little plasma volcano triangle 
with a with a, a line that goes all the way up through that triangle, which is the plasma volcano, all the way up to the top of this circular part, and that creates the peace sign, the sign for peace. It's also called, uh, it's symbolized by the Olympic torch, it's symbolized by uh, the phoenix. The phoenix is what... Um, the bird, it, it sort of looks like a bird too. So I want to, I want to, I want you to imagine that this beam of plasma, and there are many, but there's one main one, one gigantic one. That gigantic beam of plasma shoots up, but it doesn't stay a beam. It doesn't stay a pole because it's fluid and it's plasma and it's got currents and eddies and, and torrents and uh, it's flowing. So it's, it branches out in different places as plasma does, even as water does and air. Um, and it creates different little shapes up there in the sky. It creates a light show for everyone in the world. And we interpret that light as we see fit. We interpret that light according to our customs and our traditions and our upbringing and our experience, our unique perspective on the world and how we relate images to things that we have already experienced or are aware of. And those things, those images and symbols, those turn into our um, our icons for our religions and those things that are deeply ingrained within the collective worldwide subconscious that we all share. It turns into the image of the thunderbird, the great bird in the sky. Um, also the image of the double axe, right? It'll shoot up as a, as a pillar or pole, branches out on both sides. It gives the double axe imagery. The tree of life, Trees are often associated with this. There's a lot of tree symbolism. The world tree is the ultimate tree. It is uh, the quintessential tree or, or light pillar or sky beam, however you'd like to call it. Now, keep in mind, there's lots of different words because we have so many different languages and so many types of ways of describing things that we've come up with different variations of this. And then we argue about whose variation is right or wrong. I'd say it's a good idea for us to put those variations together so that we can see the bigger picture. Uh, it's also referenced as Thor's hammer. So this is the hammer of Thor. It's got the handle, shoots up. It's got both sides of it. The menorah, uh, the feather of Mahat or Mat, Mahat. It's also seen as Atlas, the Titan. Um, it creates basically a sort of stick figure after it shoots up and you see the initial beam. I believe that there are also adjacent plasma volcanoes um, to, on the opposite ends of the central one at the North Pole. And there are many other ones around the world, but these are the main ones. I think there are three of them up there. Two act as sort of the witnesses to the middle one, which is the largest one. And then those two off to the sides, as they shoot up, they are inclined toward the greater beam, which means they become one. This creates the legs of the squatter man or the stick figure up in the sky, um, which shoots up into one pole or one beam. And then it spreads out again almost looking like it's holding its hands up into the sky, holding up the sky. That gives us Atlas, the ancient titan of old, who holds up the sky, not the earth, but the sky. It's also known as the Pillars of Hercules or the Pillars of Hermes. Uh, we symbolize this every Christmas. We, we, we bring this symbol into our house. We call it a Christmas tree. <laughs> um, that's, that's really what it is. Uh, you see the beam, the main beam is the trunk of the tree that shoots up, and then the plasma torrents that shoot off from the side create the branches. It's the tree of life as well. And then you have little sparks, little pieces of energy that are shooting off or explosions during the plasma apocalypse or various lights. Um, even those things that get sucked up into this whirlwind that's created during the depressurization event, those can be seen as ornaments on the tree of life that are just Fl flying around it like little cars and trucks and people and whatever. Those are little ornaments on the actual tree of life around Christmas time. That's when one of these events happens. Uh, it's also known as the Spear of Destiny. It's a spear. It's a beam. It's a plank. It is a stake. It is a nail. It is all of these things. Uh, it's also known as the Burning Man. Or what 
I like to call it the postman because it's a post and it's a man. And that's where we get a lot of uh, postman symbolism in the movies. I don't know if you've caught on to that yet, but um, it is the ultimate postman, basically. Instead of saying mailman, they purposefully say postman. It is the holy staff. It is the magic wand. It is the spine of Osiris and the spine of the world. This beam that comes up from inside of the earth is known as the rampart of heaven. Rampart's like a tower. It's also known as Jacob's ladder. In the Bible, uh, this character, this person, Jacob, had this vision where he looked and he saw these angels were going up and coming down from this ladder that, went, that shot up into the sky from the earth. It's also, in fiction, symbolized by Jack's beanstalk. This, uh, this beanstalk, or this reed, or this tree, or whatever it is, is seen as growing up or spiraling up like a, like a beanstalk or a vine, uh, or a rope, a celestial rope, a cosmic rope, however you want to see it, and it shoots up and it takes you to the world, uh, to the macrocosmic world, to the world of the giants, literally. <coughs> Excuse me. It's also seen as the trident. Remember, if there are three of them up there, if there's one in the middle followed by two witnesses to each side, uh, then that would give us the trident symbolism as well. The Vajra the sacred arrow. It's also known simply as the sign. It's the sign that everyone has been waiting for. It is a sign that all of your worries are over. That this, not all of your worries, I shouldn't say that. It's a sign that the world as it is in this current state of low energy vibration has flipped and changed to high energy vibration. It's a sign that everything has changed. It's a sign that the apocalypse itself is over. It's a sign that the light and the energy has completely shifted direction and is now going the other way, which means we have gone away from the neutral point of the cataclysm. The neutral point is when most of the destruction happens. It's also known as the signal and many, many, many other things. I'm excited to see what all of you come up with, right? <clears throat> I'm excited to see that. And if you're watching in the future, I hope that you'll leave some comments. If I missed anything, feel free to share that with everyone else so that we can all learn together. <clears throat> all right, sweet. So I've had some images over here up on the side. These are more like old world showing you these, these columns, these pillars, um, these, these, these ancient objects of worship that were literally seen as God sticks. That this right here, in its, simpl in its simplest form, represents deification, represents uh, something that has creative power and ability. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take that off the screen. There we go. And I want to share with you, let's take that one off there too. All right, I want to show with you some ex some examples, okay? So this I see this stuff in the movies and in books and stuff like that, symbolically speaking, all of the time. I feel like life shows me a reflection of the truth, little breadcrumbs of things that I notice. For example, here we have the movie Superman, and this is the original Superman, 1978 or 79, and watch what happens on planet Krypton. Right? So we've got these bad guys who are arrested, basically, for being rebellious. They're sort of fallen angels. And then watch what happens. There's this dome of what looks like ice that opens up. And right from the middle of this dome, a beam of light shoots up into the sky. Right? And as you can see, the rest of their world sort of looks like it could be Antarctica. Hmm? Anyways, uh, that's one reference to the dome opening up, the world depressurizing, going through this polarity shift, and this beam of light shooting up, right, uh, that takes care of the bad guys. Here's another one. These are just my personal favorite ones that I like. I, there's, a, there's a bunch more. This is from a video game that I've played a lot. Uh, it's called Zelda Breath of the Wild. And they're, the main boss at the end, his name is Ganon, which means um, 
from the garden or of the garden. And Ganon is always represented as basically red plasma. He's a shapeshifter. He can change into all different kinds of shapes and stuff. And he and in this video game, he has created this plasma dome around this central castle where this princess, commonly known as Sophia Wisdom, right? The blue beam has been kept. That castle represents Mount Maru. It's a jagged castle. It's a high and lofty cliff. It's a plasma volcano where the light has retracted. And so it's being kept prisoner within the structure, within this castle, within this container or box. Um, and then uh, Ganon's responsible for keeping her down there because you have to remember, there's a time when the beam goes up and makes its appearance and is seen as a savior and a deliverer and changes the world system, right? But then there's the time when the beam retracts and is seen as sacrificing itself in order to stop the apocalypse, right? And then it's hidden and then it's kidnapped or it's taken hostage or whatever, and it fades down into the inner recesses of the earth. So this is, this is a little... Uh, as you can see, the, there's the blue beam, which is going to be shot in the video game from four different sides. There will be four different blue beams, even though there's probably really like one major one, right? But these blue beams shoot and they touch. And in the middle where they touch, they go down into the castle in order to destroy Ganon. There's the castle right there. There's the four uh, beams. And those beams, as you can see, Ganon, he looks like a phantazoid or something right there. The blue beam comes down and it helps to destroy Ganon. I um, also wanted to share this. I've shared this before, but if you type in pillar of light, there are so many examples throughout our culture being real and fantastic, uh, fact and fiction at the same time, that it is being cataloged by various people across the world. Um, you can go here to tvtropes.org, type in pillar of light, and this is what you will get. You have all of these different folders. I'll open all of them so you can see how many there are here. These are all instances. All those blue highlighted words are all instances in books, in movie, in manga, in television, in history, in real life, all the different examples of a blue beam emerging from the earth and shooting up to the sky. There are so many, I can't even, I don't have the time to go over each individual one right now, but look how many there are. It's still going. It goes and it goes and it goes and it goes and it goes. This is how many examples. This permeates our collective subconscious worldwide. It's everywhere. There's, um, speaking of movies and the blue beam being in movies, the first example that I could find of the blue beam in a movie was a 1932 film um, done in German called The Blue Light or Das Blau Licht. Das Blau Licht. Sorry if I messed that up. Uh, but it's called The Blue Light. It's really interesting. I don't need to get into too much detail about it. But basically, it's a story about there's this huge cliff that shoots up into the sky. And this local town becomes jealous of a woman who is able to climb the cliff and get to this blue light that is coming from inside of this um, this cliff area, right? This mountain, basically. And any, any of the men who try to climb the mountain to get to that blue beam, uh, they fall and they die. So they become jealous and they figure that this woman must be a witch. So she's uh, ridiculed throughout the movie. Now check this out. That's not just the only interesting part that it has, that it's a movie so old that's done in black and white, actually. <laughs> you can't even tell that it's a blue beam. Um, but it's so old, right? That Hitler watched this movie and he was so dumbfounded and impressed that he arranged a meeting with, uh, I believe it was the director. Yeah, it was the director, Lenny Riefenstahl, this girl right here. He arranged a meeting with her to hire her to um, produce some of his own propaganda movies while the war was going on, right? And as we know, Hitler was somebody who was very interested in these ancient legends, these occult stories about um, artifacts like the Spear of Destiny or the Fountain of Youth. Both, I believe, are the same thing. Uh, let's see. This right here is a quote. Let me see if you can see all that. A little bit, huh? Well, this is a quote um, from a book that talks about this movie, The Blue Light. 
I want to read this quote to you. It talks about when the director met Hitler, and it says, uh, her reaction upon meeting him is powerful. She says, I had an almost apocalyptic vision that I was never able to forget. It seemed as if the Earth's surface were spreading out in front of me, like a hemisphere that suddenly splits apart in the middle, spewing out an enormous jet of water so powerful that it touched the sky and shook the Earth. I felt quite paralyzed. It's worth noting that the violent, um, that the violent, that the violent naturalism of her vision. Or it's worth noting how violent and natural her vision seems, basically. Water does the impossible. It cracks the earth. It rises up, overcoming gravity. And it says, uh, Reifenstahl believes that she is doing the opposite of falling. So instead of, uh, instead of falling, they basically say that they thought that she was floating in this vision that she had. Very interesting stuff. It goes on to say, it is the fact that Hitler intimidates Reifenstahl that draws her close to him. So they developed this uh, relationship all because of this, this Blue Beam movie that she made. Now here's a quote from Nostradamus. Nostradamus in one of his quatrains says, Before the empire changes, a very wonderful event will take place. The field moved, the pillar of Porf Porphyrir. How do you say that? P Porf. Porphyry, porphyry, the pillar of porphyry put in place, changed on the gnarled rock. So let me read that one more time. Before the empire changes, a very wonderful event will take place. The field moved. I believe he's talking about the magnetic field of the earth is being moved, right? Uh, he says the pillar, so the pillar of light of porphyry. Now porphyry is a volcanic rock. The pillar of the volcanic rock, interesting, put into place, changed on the gnarled rock. It sounds to me like, like Nostradamus may have been tapping into uh, visions of this light beam, the sky beam that shoots up from the plasma volcano, aka Rupus Negra, Mount Maru, etc. There's also various um, stories around the world about these sky pillars or world pillars that seem to keep apart the sky and the earth because mankind in times past was very fearful of the sky falling down and crushing us here on earth. And I believe that there's a lot of truth to that too. There's something called the eight pillars. The eight pillars, also known as the eight pillars of the sky, are a concept from Chinese mythology. Located in the eight cardinal directions, there are a group of eight mountains or pillars which have been thought to hold up the sky. They are symbolically important types of an axis mundi, and uh, this is their cosmology. So there are these pillars associated with mountains. I find that they're usually associated with volcanoes and mountains. Uh, I did a video about this particular deity named Rod, or Rod, Rod. Rod, we'll just call him Rod. He's the Rod God. He's the God of Rods. I mean, he literally is that, right? His name is Rod. This comes from uh, Slavic and Croatian um, and some other places too, Russian, Serbian, Ukrainian. In the pre-Christian religion of Eastern and Southern Slavs is the God of the family, ancestors, and fate, perhaps as the supreme God. Among Southern Slavs, he's known as Sud, the judge. He's usually mentioned together with uh, Rohanisti deities. Uh, one's first haircut was dedicated to him. So imagine that Rod over here, uh, it's probably not easy to see him there. There's another image. Anyway, um, the rod, the beam that shoots up, symbolically is this sword that slays the hydra, the red plasma that's coming down into our world, which is also seen as hair and all kinds of other things, snakes and hair and all kinds of stuff, right? You give this god of the sky a hair cut. You cut off all of that plasma that is entering into our world by reinstituting uh, the electromagnetic shield that wraps around our world or the confinement dome. Um, that wraps around our world. It cuts off all of that red plasma and all of that loose hair falls into our world and becomes trapped. So that's why uh, a child's first haircut in these 
countries in these cultures is dedicated to the rod god. Uh, let's see, we also have a quote here. Now remember, we went over this book called Vril. Gato Negro, thank you, man. I super appreciate you. I'm, let me jump back in the chat real quick, see what you said. Oh, he, didn't, he just wanted to give me $10. I, pff, thank you, thank you. I super appreciate you. All right, cool. Um, so this is a quote from the book Vril, right? It goes by a few different titles, but I'm just going to call it Vril. And he says, uh, this is the account of a man who was mining with his buddy, with a bunch of people, right? Um, and he wanted to go back while everyone else was taking a break and he wanted to, to mine and to make the mine deeper. Him and his buddy went to go deepen the mine and they fell into the earth, right? It, the earth opened up. They fell down into this huge crevice. They went into the inner recesses of the earth, into these unknown cavernous, huge cavernous systems, and they saw otherworldly monstrous animals that were gigantic and gigantic creatures, etc. This is a description of what he says. He's talking to his buddy because he went, he went back up and he was really messed up by this experience, right? And he was quiet and he was shook and his friend's like, hey man, you can confide in me. Tell me what's wrong. You're acting all weird. You're acting different. So in the book, which is posed as fiction, but I believe it was written as fact and an actual account. He says, I will tell you all. When the cage stopped, I found myself on a ridge of rock and below me, the chasm, taking a slanting direction, shot down to a considerable depth, the darkness of which my lamp could not have penetrated. But through it, to my infinite surprise, streamed upward a steady, brilliant light. Could it be any volcanic fire? I mean, in that case, surely I would have felt the heat. Interesting. I believe that he's talking about um, the plasma that, that exists under our feet inside of our world and how it was shooting up and he could see that plasma beam and he wasn't burned by it. There was no heat being emitted from it. My theory so far is that it is what's called non-thermal plasma or cold plasma. That's plasma that you could probably just touch and it wouldn't burn you. It wouldn't harm you whatsoever. Now, here's an interesting story. Now, before we get into this, let me take this down real quick. Before we get into this next uh, portion here, I would like to talk about the plasma volcano. Boom. Actually, you know what? Let me do this. Let me put up some pictures here. That way I can have something to look at while we talk. Be right with you. One second. Oop, did that work? No. Okay, I'm messing it up. Sorry. I'm kind of nervous. All right, let me try this again one time here. Okay, it's not that one. It's this one. Dang. Uh, let's do... This one right here, and then I'll just change it. There we go. Thanks for being patient and waiting for me. I appreciate it. Okay, so that's that's the pictures there. So let me change that. Dang, how do I do this? There we go. Boom. Okay, cool. So that should work. Did it work? Boom. No. Okay. There. <laughs> Hopefully that worked. Yes. Okay, sweet. All right, cool. So now I'll just go ahead and put that on automatic so we can talk about things. All right, cool. Thanks for your patience. Okay, so the next part I want to talk about is where the actual beam shoots up from. Remember, I, remember, we were talking about how there are many ancient stories that um, give reference to this sort of what I call the cave of saviors. It is an opening that goes deep into the hollow recesses of our world um, that has many mysterious and magical connotations um, that that 
are attributed to it over time. Many people have talked about this cave system or this entrance, and this is why I believe there are so many savior-type figures and god-type figures that are said, symbolically, to have been born in this cave. They, sh they come up out of this cave system. Um, it's also seen in a lot, in a lot of our, um, fiction and our fantasy, like Aladdin, when he goes to the cave of wonders and stuff. So I want to share this with you. Um, this is a story about that cave. There is a cave that Zeus was born in. It's known as Psycho cave. And this story is called Zeus and the honey theft. I'll go ahead and just pull this down for a second. Uh, according to a legend, Zeus was kept in the cave by bees this is when he was a child, when this was when Zeus was not born and did not make his appearance into the world yet. According to legend, Zeus was kept in the cave by bees. These are the holy bees. These are the sacred bees, which I believe are little balls of plasma that float around. And the bees did not allow anyone to enter. One time, there were four mortals, or humans, who tried to enter the cave and steal the honey that the bees made, which would be like a... Uh, a sort of ooze or a sort of um, gooey residue that plasma leaves behind, sometimes mixed with water. It's seen as the honey being mixed with the water as well, the sacred honey. So these humans, uh, they, they sneak into this cave, Cycros cave, and they intend to steal this honey that these sacred bees make from Zeus. In order not to be stung by the bees, they covered their bodies with copper clothing. Interesting, right? Why would they need to do that if they were regular bees, right? However, Zeus got angry and struck them with lightning bolts that tore the bronze clothing. Uh, for them not to die, the three fates, the three fates I also believe are those three main beams at the top of the world, the two witnesses on the side and the main beam in the middle. The three fates and goddesses, Temis, transformed these men into birds. So the, the theory is, is that people cannot die in this cave, that the cave is so charged full of energy that it amplifies the spirit and keeps the body from dying. So instead of killing them, Zeus changes them into something else, which I thought was really interesting. All right, cool. Uh, let's see what else we got here. The column. The column is another one too, right? And we have a lot of words that sound like column that make their way into our headlines quite often. We have Columbia, uh, the Columbia Pictures, the District of Columbia, Columbine, um, uh, Columbia Pictures, which, you, which usually shows um, an unfinished pyramid, and then a woman holding a light at the top of it with a blue sash spiraling around her. That also symbolizes the blue beam at the top of the unfinished pyramid, which is a plasma volcano. Uh, let's see. Let's, let's get back to the plasma volcano topic real quick. There we go. All right. So there is this mountain. There is this opening. Now, what happens is whenever this blue uh, basically, I believe it's blue because it's ionized oxygen, okay? There may be some other gases or other chemicals in there, but I believe that oxygen is the main one, and it becomes ionized or electrified to such a degree that it becomes plasma, and that plasma is uh, reflects the color of the chemical compound, which is oxygen is blue, right? It's like a lightish white blue, um, and that exists within the earth. When that plasma or that ionized um, current shoots up and it is released, right? It goes up. You have, to, you have to remember, it's not just slowly making its way. It's being shot through uh, the corridor. And the corridor is a, is, a, is a magnet, basically. And that magnet is pushing all of that energy up and out, getting rid of it. So it shoots out at incredible speeds. Um, and it comes out of what is known as the Holy Mountain. And I believe that this is the archetype for many of the Holy Mountains that we have read about and come across worldwide. I believe that one of our problems is that we look at all of these Holy Mountains and other instances of, of other topics and subjects as well. Uh, but the Holy Mountain is a good example of one. We look at them and we imagine and we take it for granted that they are all separate accounts. That Olympus is a separate account from Sinai, which is a separate account from Mount Maru, which is a separate... What if they're not, right? What if all of these had a, an original holy mountain, a sacred mountain where the God was born from out of a cave, right? And then 
for some reason, those people had to migrate away from that mountain, away from that sacred cave and away from that area of safety for whatever reason, maybe for their own safety. And as they left, they brought all of their stories, all of their traditions, all of their cultures, all of their symbolism, and they applied it to their local geography, their new home, right? Sort of giving an homage and reverence to remembering where they came from, which is ironic because they have forgotten. <laughs> Most people have, I think. It's called the Holy Mountain. It's called the Unfinished Pyramid. That's why you have that in Freemasonry. They always have this unfinished pyramid or whatever. I've heard a lot of different symbolism. I heard a lot of different people. I've come up with, I've come up with many of my own um, reasons why it might be unfinished all of the time and that how there's this eye and stuff above it, right? I believe that it represents a plasma volcano or a volcano, just a, any, any volcano really, but specifically the plasma volcano. Why? Because you have the eye of God right above it. This is a specific place in our world where directly above that mountain that's missing its top, which is a volcano, you have this opening up in the sky that's seen as the all-seeing eye and many other things. As this beam shoots up, and touches that circle up there in the sky, the wheel, the eye, whatever you want to call it. And then we see this in our imagery, in our pop culture, in our books, in our history. It's called the Holy Mountain, the Unfinished Pyramid. I call it the Plasma Volcano, Mount Olympus, Mount Maru. I believe it's also known as the Gemel or the G, right? Why do they put that G in the middle of um, old maps? Why does the Illuminati use the G when it comes to uh, the square and the compass, right? Right there in the middle is the Gemel. The Gemel is um, a, a symbol that almost looks like it's a little triangle or a split at the bottom with a beam that comes right out of the top of it and a little flare at the top. Um, the Gemel also symbolizes a foot and it means to walk, to go to, basically, right? Uh, to travel, to explore. And it's put right in the middle of the world, almost like a little reminder, like, go here, walk here, go to this place. At least that's what I get from it. Uh, it's known as the Misty Mountain, right? There seems to be, um, according to legends, uh, this mountain is associated with uh, fog and mist. And um, on the island where this mountain is, it's also known as sort of a magical forest, sort of a sylvan magical kind of forest um, where there's a lot of weird creatures and stuff. It's called the Shadow Mountain, the cave. It's referred to as the Cave of Wonders. The compass and the square too. So basically in Freemasonry, you have the compass and the square, right? The compass looks like that, right? And then usually there's a little round thing right at the top of the compass. That would be your eye in the sky, right? And then it comes down like that, which creates the, the plasma volcano, okay? This shape, the compass shape that comes down, I'm just using my fingers because I don't want to take the time. I've already taken up enough of you guys' time um, trying to fix things. But anyways, so the compass comes downwards like that, and it creates a, a volcano, a mountain, a triangle, right, with a, with a circle at the top of it. And then you have the square right underneath it. The square represents the land. The square represents the, the, the cardinal directions of the earth itself, right? So the square is on the bottom because it's the earth. The compass is on top because it represents the plasma volcano. And there's a little circle part where the compass can move at the middle, at the fulcrum or at the apex. Um, and that's a circle representing the eye in the sky directly above the plasma volcano. It's also known as um, the Black Mountain, Rupas Nigra which literally means the mountain that is black or the dark mountain, the high and lofty cliffs, the dark cliffs, um, the magnetic mountain as well. This is, this gives good reason as to why all of our compasses point towards true North. They are pointing and being pulled towards the strongest magnetic, um, part of our world, which it lies at the North pole, right? Uh, let's see. We also have Black Demeter, right? Black Demeter. Demeter is one of these goddesses of, of old. Uh, Black Demeter is seen as uh, this this female goddess who is grieving. So she puts on this sort of black garb and uh, that represents symbolically the plasma volcano as well. Why is she grieving? Because her son, right? If, if the mountain is the mother that gives birth to the light, right? When that light retracts and is and disappears and is gone and there and is no longer filling the world with wonderful magic and energy and stuff, then the world goes into a period of mourning and sadness and crying out. 
So that's where that comes from. Uh, the, the Black Volcano, the Dark Mountain, the Cave of Saviors, the Rock, simply put, the Rock, the Rock of Ages, etc., and so on and so forth. Uh, let me just check the chat, make sure everything's good. Oh, cool. We got a couple of people in the chat. Ex Screen name 229 says the pyramids are tones. They represent eyesight or speed of light. And that's exactly what Jay is talking about. We also have Escape from Babylon who says, I need to watch the old cartoon movie Heavy Metal. A lot of the same themes that Jay always talks about too. You'll find that these themes are all over the place. Once you start learning about plasma apocalypse symbolism, God, it's filled in so many holes for me um, and made sense of so many anomalies and so much symbolism on television, video games, movies, stories, etc., that I literally see it all over the place. I believe it's, it's, they say that the elite hide things, they hide the truth in plain sight. That's not hidden at all. It's just that we are blind, right? It's not being hidden. It's being put, it's being offered to you. It's being given to you. Oh, excuse me. I sound getting too excited. It's being given. It's being offered. It's saying, hey, here you go. But it's up to them to recognize it or not. If they recognize it, then they shall receive it, right? If they don't recognize it, they shall be entertained or amused by it. Thanks, Candy. Appreciate you. Hey, my brother's in the chat. Straight Jacket White Rabbit says the U.S. government, along with Bigelow, studied it for like 22 years to try and unlock its secrets. Ooh, interesting. All right, uh, let's go back to the notes here. All right, so there's, there's a Proto-Indo-European root word. I like to study etymology and the study of the origin of words, right? Break them down to their uh, one or two letter roots, right? The root, pag, P-A-G, is the root for the word pagan, pag on, those of the pag. What is a pag? Now, that word pag in, in the ancient Proto-Indo-European language, pag over time became pronounced differently. So sometimes it was pronounced pak or pak, like Pac-Man. Pak, P-A-K, like Tupac or Deepak Chopra. Bak, like a baktun. Uh, Bakas, the us at the end means strength. It means strong. So bakos, bakos, bakos is literally one of the ancient gods, the god of wine, uh, the god of the red sky. When um, the seas look like they're made out of um, red wine and whatnot. Uh, it's the root of pagan. It is the Vav. The Vav is the number six. So a lot of people are enamored with the number six and they're like, oh, number six is scary. Go away, number six, right? Especially three of them. Oh my God, three, three sixes in a row. Well, it's not the six. It's not the number. Um, it's got more to do with the shape of the glyph. The glyph itself is a spiral. So it doesn't matter if it's three nines, which is a spiral in one direction, right? Or three sixes, which is a spiral in the opposite direction. Both of those things are the perfect spiral represented by, by being repeated three times. The perfect spiral flips to, to go from six to nine or nine to six because of the polarity shift in our world where the energies reverse and they go the other way. Anne-Marie Penton's in the chat and says, Jay, I see things so different now in large part to you. Many thanks. You're very welcome. Gato Negro says, Jay Dreamer's great presentation. Jay, every time I listen to the 101s, uh, more is unveiled. Great, great, great. I'm glad you guys are getting something from it, most importantly. And if you're not, I hope you're entertained. <laughs> Let them eat cake. Okay, where was I? Oh, I was talking about the Proto-Indo-European word pag, the root word pag, um, which comes from pagan. Now, most people would say that pagan means of the hills or the hill people. The pag means to fasten, right? It is the exact same word. It's a, it's a fastener. A fastener in the same type of manner as a peg that you would hit into the ground to fasten a tent or a structure into the earth. It is something that is connected and fastened, tying one thing above the earth to the earth itself, right? That is the pag or the peg. Um, it means to fasten. It is the exact same thing as a tent peg, or a column. And uh, it also is the same thing as a nail. 
So that's why we have so much nail symbolism, right? That's why to kill a vampire, you have to put a stake or a peg through the middle of him in order to kill him. Um, and that's, that's the ancient root word. It is the peg. It is the nail. It is the vav. It is the, the nail of the world, right? That comes up out and, and it's connected. It's fastening uh, the earth and the sky, keeping them stable, essentially. So the people who come from that place are known as the Pagon. They actually go by many names. There's um, Tatarians, the Pagon, uh, many different words for this lost tribe of people who spread out from the middle of the earth and created different cultures and tribes and families and whatnot. Uh, the beam appears. This is the arrival of the savior figure. When that beam appears, that's the sign that all is well. Every, the, the apocalypse is over. A new age has begun. The old system is destroyed. Make of it what you will, right? Magic has entered into the world. That blue beam is shooting up into the sky. It's not just a light, right? It is energy that is filling our world. We live in a closed system. So if we live in a closed system and energy is constantly being introduced into it, right? That means that the world is going to fill up with that energy. And that energy is what we refer to today as magic because we don't quite understand it yet. We're just tapping into plasma physics and um, the electric universe theory and things of that nature. It's just magic to us. To us. It's indistinguishable from magic um, is the reality. <laughs> So the beam appears, that is the arrival of the Savior, the light of the world. It is the signal. It is the sign that, hey, you made it. Hey, everything's going to be okay. Hey, the apocalypse is over. You don't have to worry about the world storm, the tempest getting sucked up or anything. You can take a break because it's not going to happen again for a while, right? And then we establish these traditions and um, these rituals and stuff in order to guarantee that our progeny, that our family members, a long time from now, when they forget all about this apocalypse ever having happened, that they will be in a safe place, that they will be practicing safe practices like lighting candles, for example, um, in order to keep light during this time of darkness, the three days of darkness that, that comes before the light of the world shoots up. Now, the three days of darkness starts typically during one apocalyptic cycle on the winter solstice. The other one is the summer solstice. So when the world goes dark at the winter solstice, it stays dark for three days. After three days, the Savior is born. The light of the world comes up out of the cave and shows itself as it has been in the underworld up until that point, right? Uh, what else? And also, this is like if, 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 if anyone happens to be watching, I know, some, you know, occasionally we get different kinds of people. If you happen to be a religious person, regardless of if it's Christian or Muslim or Jewish or anything like that, I'm not trying to pick apart your religion or slam on your religion or change your beliefs or anything. You feel, please feel free to believe whatever you'd like to believe. This is just my experience. And this is not for me to try to, you know, make other people believe in what I believe in but I'm just sharing my walk. I'm sharing my perspective as I go along. Hey, I just saw, I forgot I had this. I actually have Mjolnir, uh, Thor's hammer. Same thing, same concept. Uh, nobody can wield it. Nobody can pick it up. Just like nobody can take the sword from the stone, except for like the true king, right? So when that beam appears, that's a good signal. That's the sign. In Ghostbusters, right? You had the, uh, the key master who was looking for the gatekeeper and he he walks up to a horse. There's a scene where he walks up to the horse and you just think that he's crazy, that he's just acting like crazy Rick Moranis. And he says, wait for the sign. Then all the captives or all the prisoners will be released. Well, that's hitting home for me. Wait for the sign. Then all of the captives, all of you, all of us who are prisoners to the system that we live in today will be released. It will be the year of Jubilee. It will be the year of jubilation. It'll be a time of celebrating. Because this old system is no longer here. We no longer will be slaves to jobs and to governments and all of this stuff. We will be truly free to live as we see fit, to survive as we see fit. Uh, when that beam disappears, that is seen. Remember, it, it, it appears and it disappears um, right after the neutral point of the plasma apocalypse. So when it disappears, that means the electromagnetic dome or barrier has gone back up, cutting off the red plasma, but the energy is now going down as it is today. And we don't see that blue light. We don't see that blue pillar or that, 
that blue beam any longer. It is seen symbolically as having sacrificed itself in order to stop the destruction. And it retreats. It goes into hiding, into the inner recesses of the earth, waiting, sleeping, biding its time until its next appearance, right? And so the world goes into mourning and the world tries to do all of these different energetic um, rituals and stuff to bring it back and to pray to it and, and all these things in order to hopefully get that eternal flame to reappear one day. It is the disappearance of the God, the goddess, the savior type figures, etc. Let me do some more screen sharing. I want to jump back into this screen sharing and show some cool stuff to you guys. All right, so we talked about columns, right? Let me just read this to you. Column, this is from edamonline.com. It says, a pillar, a long cylindrical architectural support. That also could be applied to the house of the world that we live in. The central pillar of the world that we live in, the axis mundi. Also, the vertical division of a page, etc. Colomba. Now, do you see how this, in French, there's a B right there? Ah, you can't see it, dang. Hold on, let me see if I can make that smaller. All right, see right there, right at the end, there's a B in French, Colomba, Columbia, just how we, how we talked about, Cologne, like Christopher Cologne, uh, the column, the pillar, the columna, the pillar, collateral from Colomin, the top, the summit, the Proto-Indo-European root word, Kel, to be like Cal El, Kel, um, to be prominent or a hill. Now check this out. I want to share some really interesting stuff with you. Uh, this is, I'm just going to, I don't know. Well, I'll just say this is from Van der Zwan channel. I'm just going to show you just some stuff that I have found from different places that sort of, sort of symbolically show you what is going on. I wanted to, I wanted to share that one one more time because that one went by kind of quick. I think I might have it on double the speed still. So this guy's up at the North Pole. You can see the Northern Lights and stuff. And then that blue beam shoots up. I don't know what that's from, but I thought that that was really interesting. And uh, some people, uh, this this video is even called the Plasma Event. So I'm I'm honored to be a part of um, all of this. This is a great movie too, by the way. Um, I, there are, there are many people who are coming to the realization, many people who are putting these pieces together about energy and how energy works and how it manifests and how it affects us on the grand scale of things in resetting our world. And there's a lot of people out there that are investigating and they're they're making their own presentations and stuff. And I'm just a part of it, and I'm honored to be a part of it. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, this, So this is plasma in a vortex. So I want you to imagine flipping this image upside down. This is what you would see right above that pillar of light when it meets the hole in the sky with the red plasma that is coming up out of it, right? This is Medusa's hair. That's the hair of the gods that is cut off by the blue pillar or whatnot, right? And you can see it swirls around, it wraps around, and it makes its way out of that hole or that opening. This one is awesome. So that cylinder right above my finger is a neodymium magnet. I believe it's one of the, if not the strongest magnet that we can make in the world today so far. This person runs an electrical current over the top, the, the flat part of this magnet, and it creates an energetic dome. Look at that. You see that? That's because the magnet pushes the plasma away. The plasma, all plasma, is repelled by a strong electromagnetic force or a, a strong magnetic force, I should say, right? So it pushes it and it creates this little invisible bu bubble or dome or barrier or shield. This is Captain America's shield. This is the agents of shield, the, any, any shield symbolism. If that, that shield is red because it is full of hydrogenized, if that's a word, Plasma, hydrogen, ionized hydrogen, basically. Uh, and that gives us a red shield or a Roth shield. Red, Roth shield, Roth child. See where that comes from? And as you can see, I'm playing it in like one quarter of the speed. But you can see, imagine blowing this up onto the grand scale of the world that, we're, that we live on right now in this plane of existence. Here's another one. This guy has a vacuum chamber and he literally recreates the blue beam and you watch the tree of life as it grows. You can even see the different wavelengths up there. You see that? How it's starting to change? Now, keep this in mind as we're watching this. Because remember, it's not just a beam and that's it. It's not just a staff and that's it. 
as time goes on, we watch this beam change its shape in the sky. It branches out. It creates these little, uh, these little uh, turrets, these little uh, eddies and, and flows of, of plasma that look like branches branching out from the central area. Uh, let's see, that one's okay. Let me see. Uh, this one is called Plasma in a Magnetic Field. And this is from uh, George Chaniotakis channel. All right, so as you can see there, the plasma is spinning around. That's what it wants to do. That's what fluid um, naturally likes to do is to, is to twist and to spin and to spiral. Anyways, that's another example of it right there. I like in this video though, let me rewind that a bit. I like how it shows you how it makes these little waves in the atmosphere itself, right? We've seen that in a few different places too. Oh, this is something else. All right, cool. Uh, what else did I want to share? What else did I want to share? I did want to share a video um, that somebody had made. And I don't remember who. I'm super sorry. I get a lot of people sending videos and stuff um, or making videos and asking me to check them out and stuff. Um, and I can't remember what channel it is, but I do want to show the video. And if you know who made it, sweet. I'll totally give him a shout out. Hey, Heart. Heart. I'm jumping back in the chat. Who is that? Heart of Astrea says, I have a video of magenta colored lightning. Ooh, that sounds interesting too. Yeah, the magenta lightning. The magenta is, is one of the color spectrums for the hydrogen plasma, I believe. Thank you. I super appreciate you. All right. So let's share this video here. Boom. Is it that one? No, it's this one. Uh, it's called the Plasma Event, Energy Beams, and Portals. This one is very well put together. I've seen quite a few. I've shown you a couple already. But like I said, this is a movement that's growing. This is an area of, of research that people are looking into. And I love it because they're able to just... There are some people who are purely scientific about it. And they're like, oh, I just want to look at all of the physics and the math and the science and this and that. Some people are totally way off into Wonderland. And they're just showing all of the wonderful pictures like, my, like me. I am. Right? And they show you all the different imagery of, of how it's symbolically represented in the media. And then there are those in the middle who are able to balance the two, saying, hey, in the media, in our pop culture, we've got this, and it's shown to us so many times. Let's see how that could work scientifically. Let's see how that could, how that could actually work with real application in the real world. And let's see how we can tie this in to connect modern academics, modern teachings, modern science with the beliefs of the old world and the old ways. As you can see, um, the blue beam is also often associated with um, a loss of gravity, or what is known commonly as gravity. Hey, that's my mom. Look at you. What are you doing? Hey, mom. <laughs> wow, right on. Yay. Thanks. Super appreciate you, mom. Um, good to see you. Anyway, so this is the blue beam, right? And it's shown in the movies. Um, associated with the loss of gravity, as we already talked about during the worldwide depressurization event, and people get sucked up into the sky. So this blue beam is usually associated with the symbolism and the imagery of the rapture, of the return of Jesus, of aliens and UFOs using some sort of a beam or a tractor beam to pull people up, right? Oh, you, oh, there's, oh, I didn't know there was music. Oh, shoot. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, everybody in the chat. Thank you. Fudge. Okay, well, I thought I was speaking over the video. Hopefully that doesn't come back to bite me in the butt because um, I'm supposed to comment over the video so that nothing bad happens. <laughs> Hopefully it's fine. Um, I want to say thank you to whoever made this video. I don't know who made it. Somebody had sent it to me a while back. There are many videos like this online that people are starting to put out there where they're seeing the symbolism, as I was saying before, in what is fantastic and what is considered fiction versus real historic records, real examples and um, modern academics and science that is mixed with these legends of old and the old ways and the, and the stories of, of old. So yeah, that's all I was basically saying. I just wanted to make sure I talk. <laughs> I was trying to talk over the video so that I can comment on the video. Um, 
which is a good idea for me to do. <laughs> Anyways, these are many different examples of, of people who have made, one person in, in particular made this video. Lots of other people are starting to do this. If you make a compilation video of anything having to do with the plasma apocalypse, whether it be all of the examples of the blue beam or the red plasma or whatever it is, I would like to see it. Please drop me a link. Let me know and I'll be happy to give your channel a shout out. I would shout out this person, but I, I don't remember who they are or where this came from um, because I just downloaded the video, <laughs> basically. But anyways, there's many examples of this. It's, it's so prolific, like I said at the beginning of this video, that there are entire websites devoted to how many times the blue beam is shown. Or e not just the blue beam, like as you see right there, and uh, I think that's Superman, that's Planet Krypton. You can see that's the fire of God. That is the pillar of light that shoots up from the ground. It is seen as uh, um, the fires from the heavens and, and whatnot, right? There's the fire that comes down from the heavens, which is the red plasma. And then there's those, those uh, pillars of light that shoot up and out, right? All right, let me get rid of this since we've seen it a few, many, a few times already. Now, keep in mind, okay, there's one main beam at the huge biggest opening, which is traditionally said to be at the Axis Mundi or the center of the world, which traditionally is the North Pole. And then we've got the two witnesses, the two smaller, large openings up there as well. Um, and those also produce their own lights. However, they tend to gravitate towards the one in the middle. But then you have all of the inner um, minor entrances, the minor cave systems that go and reach down into the center of the earth. And that light is able to spread throughout all of those as well, emitting its own radiance. And people would go to those caves and they would visit them and they would get visions and they would be able to have tap into secret knowledge and the knowledge of the world and, and so many other things. Um, people had oracles and prophets and priestesses and whatnot that would, that would be dedicated to living in these caves so that they, they didn't lose these visions, that they didn't lose this energy that was imparted to them from the earth itself. Screen name 229 says, Jay, I have some plasma orbs on my channel. Uh, mind frequent frequencies from my mom's driveway cam. Sweet. Right on. I'm going to check that out for sure. Hydro bear says, does it? Ha 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 ha. I love how you question your own sharing. Love you, J dreamers. And I support you. Thank you. I super appreciate you. I've always liked your name too. Hydro bear is pretty cool. Uh, let's see here. My brother says, if anyone hasn't seen my channel, here it is. So shout out to my brother. Boom. You can click on that link that he put in there and you can go watch his, oh, his latest video is sweet too. And I might as well just plug this too. My brother and I, um, I love listening to his, his stuff, but we're, we're talking about, we have in the works an actual ghost hunt where we're going to go and be just like the real Ghostbusters and we're going to have equipment and we're going to look for frequency changes. And I don't know, he probably can explain it better than I can, but I'm going to go and we're both going to record all of it and then hopefully come back and uh, be able to put together a sweet video and maybe do it again sometime. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, also a long time ago in, in 1900, there was a book that was printed. Let me go ahead and share this. Hold on one moment. I see you, Meanie Mouse. I'll be right with you. Uh, let's see. We got, is it this one? Yes. So here's this book. It's called The Mycenaean Tree and the Pillar Cults or the Pillar Cult and its Mediterranean Relations. So this book right here, there's many of these books that have been printed. This is not a new concept. It's just that we forget these concepts or they're buried and they're hidden and they're suppressed so that most people don't have access to them because they don't know about them. Simply put, uh, this book goes into great detail about, uh, let me read some of the sections of the book. This book was written in 1900, over 120 years ago, Cretan Caves and uh, Hypothral Sanctuaries, Sacred Fig Trees and the Altar of Pyxis and Nosos. The dove cult. Oh, the dove. The dove is totally related to, first of all, dove is also dove, which means to fall, to, to jump down off of something, right? And these doves or pigeons usually are on these pillars and stuff. So there's a strong relationship between the actual physical pillars of the earth where the birds come and the doves and the pigeons stay up there and then they dive down or whatever. And the actual column itself, the dove becomes a symbol of the symbol. The labyrinth and the pillar shrines of the god of the double axe. That's very interesting. 
uh, Betalic, Tables of Offering. We got Zeus, Capetos, and the Meteoric Element. Uh, sep sepulchral, Stella, and Betalic Habitations of Departed Spirits. The Tomb of, Ju of, Juice, <laughs> of Zeus. The Tomb of Zeus. Small Dimensions and the Mycenaean Shrines. Anyways, very large words. Our vocabulary isn't, isn't that great these days um, compared to 120 years ago. The Horns of Consecration. All of, these, all of these chapters, basically, are all about sacred pillars. Pillars that were worshipped by the pillar cults and the column cults who knew that these shrines and these beams were holy that they were set apart, that they were different from any other type of beam or staff in the world. It is one of my theories and one of my beliefs. I like that part from Superman. It's one of my theories and my beliefs that um, when we see these ancient images of these gods and they're holding these staffs or a staff or a wand or a magic wand or whatever it is, maybe it's not actually the 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 human looking element that is the God or the savior or the whatever, the Christ or whatever, whatever de deity people believe in, right? Maybe it is the staff that they're holding on to. And the person is just another element to describe the properties of the beam of the staff itself. Interesting. All right, let me jump back in the chat here. I also want to check some of my notes just to make sure I don't miss anything. <laughs> Escape from Babylon says, don't ever cross streams. Right. Well, they do, right? Don't they do that in the movie? They totally cross their streams. So they put their, he's talking about Ghostbusters, whenever they have their proton packs and they all shoot out their plasma beams or whatever, they cross them and it creates this one big, huge proton pack beam or whatever, right? Very good. Very good. I'm glad that you remembered that too. We got uh, Potenza Dadio who says, I wonder if the blue beam has anything to do with aligning the chakras and the energy that rises up your spine. Well, this I, I would say so. I believe everything's interrelated. And um, the concept of aligning your chakras and allowing that energy to travel up the spine to uh, the purple chakra, to, to the head or the serpent chakra, whatever people want to call it, um, is also, it's, it's what we go through on the, macro, on the microscopic scale and something that the world, the world itself reproduces. I think that you're totally on point with that. Sharon Albo says, Jay, our Air Force had Project Bluebeam, a secret program using psychic people to remote view to see places or find people. Remote viewing is just tapping into this blue energy. Some just forget how. Now, I tend to agree with that. I also want to, uh, I want to talk about Project Bluebeam because we, we're doing, this week, we're doing our, um, our campfire episodes, the call-in episodes, all about Project Bluebeam. So here is my take. This is where I will leave it, right, um, on Project Bluebeam. I believe that somebody heard through the grapevine some pieces of the truth. I believe that, for example, let's say that my entire presentation is totally 100% true. Let's just imagine, right? Let's just speculate just for fun. Let's say that it's no one's supposed to know about it, but somebody heard like overheard a conversation where they picked up bits and pieces of it, where they heard a blue beam. Project Blue Beam, never in any of my research have I ever heard of a good explanation or reason why this beam is, is blue. Why isn't it Project Green Beam or Red Beam or Pink Beam or Orange Beam or whatever, right? It's Blue Beam. And that's why is because it's oxygen. It's, it's ionized oxygen that shoots up and it creates a bluish white color. Um, so Project Blue Beam has allegedly this holographic, this, this light show, it's a light show that happens in the sky. I believe that there will be a light show in the sky, but I don't believe I'm not going to, I, I don't want to give credit where it's not due. And I don't believe that mankind deserves that credit. Okay. For creating something that can be seen. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's impossible at all. I'm saying it's more likely that nature does this. That this Project Blue Beam is talking about an event that happens where the blue beams of the world all spread out and all shoot out from the earth itself. And um, what happens in Project Blue Beam traditionally is that people look up, they see these lights in the sky or 
holograms or whatever, the light show from the lasers, and allegedly it's from like satellites or whatever. And they're, to me, that's people trying to force it into how they understand reality to them, basically. So it's got to be lasers up there. It's got to be from the satellites or whatever, right? This is something the entire world can see everywhere, not just major cities, not just huge populated areas, but anyone, anywhere in the world, in the middle of the desert, in the middle of the forest or wherever, they'll be able to see this light show that's happening in the sky. Now, Project Bluebeam dictates that all these people will see the this light show and that they will see their saviors. Each geographic, um, each religion of, of, of its local geography, uh, the people will interpret these lights and they will see their religious iconography. They will see their religious symbolism up in there in the sky. They will see the stick figure of this gigantic person. Now imagine, like, it can't actually be Jesus if he's five, six feet tall or whatever, and he's 60 miles away. Nobody's going to see that, right? Autumn's Armory just donated 10 bucks and says, awesome topic. Thanks. Wow. Mahalo. I, I super appreciate you. Thank you. I'm glad that you get something of value out of it. Anyway, uh, Project Blue Beam, everyone in the world will see these blue beams. They will shoot up. There was m one main blue beam. Every person will interpret it according to their own religious belief systems because this is something that's happening on the cosmic scale. And the only thing that they can relate to something happening on the cosmic scale is scale, is religious stories that they have been told. And so they interpret it through the filter of their own religious programming and they see their religion coming true across the world. Hydro Bear, thank you too. I appreciate you. Hydro Bear says, love all that we are all saved to be. Very nice. Austin Newbie says, hey Jay, this has me pretty much scared. I won't lie. I can actually feel the world changing. It's crazy. Love from Tennessee. Hey, man, or woman, I don't know. Uh, don't be scared. I mean, you can. You can totally be scared. But this is good. The, the fact that you experience a little bit of fear is good because fear is motivation for you to find out more. Because I find that whenever we have knowledge, when we shed more light on something that we're afraid of, we're only afraid of it because we lack knowledge. We lack that knowledge. By teaching ourselves and becoming more immersed with these things and getting used to them, it becomes a lot less scary. Okay, uh, let's see. What was I talking about? Oh, Project Blue Beam. That's right. So everyone looks up when these blue beams shoot out. They're going to see all these different lights happening, the red, the red lights coming down from above. There will be the night of a thousand. What was it? A night of a thousand lights or something? I can't remember what it was called. But basically, Project Blue Beam says that there will be all these little orbs of light up in the sky right before the apocalypse, and that people will see them as being UFOs, that there will be an invasion, and that that's the story that we're going to be told. Oh, obviously everyone can see these lights in the sky. Obviously they're not just disappearing anymore, right? Lights, light anomalies in our atmosphere used to be real quick, and it's, it's like almost impossible to catch one, almost impossible to, to see one. Nowadays, we've got so many anomalies of energy happening up there in the atmosphere, they're lasting longer and longer and longer. Pretty soon, they'll end up staying there up in the sky. And we will see that as the UFOs are just hovering over our major cities and no one knows why the aliens haven't just shown themselves, you know, it'll be um, childhood's end all over again. Anyway, um, that's what I believe that is. I believe that it's a buildup of so much energy before the world pops, before our atmosphere pops and depressurizes, that um, it collects and it swirls in these little pools of energy that turn into light up there in our sky. And those, those lights just follow the, the natural currents that are already happening up there anyway. And also, sometimes that's why the lights are able to move and to go so fast and to cut at different angles and stuff like that, because some of these things are not physical craft, but it's just light. It's actual plasma phenomenon that's happening naturally. But we see it happening very slowly over time. So we're not looking at the bigger picture that it's building up and building up and building up, getting ready for a release. All right. So that's that's my take on Project Bluebeam. Okay. Project Bluebeam also has plasma possession, right? The overamplification of spirit energy or your soul. Whatever condition your soul is in will become amplified to the point where you can't even, it's almost impossible to change it, right? So basically, if you have low vibrations or you're a bad person, I'll just say simply put, that 
you'll become a very bad person. <laughs> if you have high vibrations and very good, you're a very good person, you'll become more like a saint, right? Actually, you know what? Speaking of saints, I want to share some pictures with you guys. There's some really interesting. They have these saints in Christianity and Catholicism that are like pillar saints. Oh, uh, one sec, excuse me. All right, sorry about that. I had my alarm go off because uh, I need. I'm gonna call my little boy here in just a minute and say good night to him. Uh, but let me let me share this with you real quick before I do. KT baby, hey, thank you. I super appreciate it. All right, so um, I'm gonna go through these probably semi quickly here. Oh, these are just some of the images that I wanted to share. Uh, this is what I made. I, I created that. That's from my website, actually. Uh, the island at the top of the world's got this volcano up there. This is this is from Indiana Jones when they open the Ark of the Covenant, right? When they open that container or that box, um, a blue beam shoots up out of out of the middle of this island and extends all the way up into the sky. This is from Ghostbusters, obviously. Here's another example of the blue beams and the plasma volcanoes. This is a real picture. This one's an artistic drawing representation. Here's a good cartoon that somebody did. That's got nothing to do with my plasma volcano theory or whatever, as far as I know, but it's showing what it may look like, right? It's showing a cartoonified version. Here's some more pillars that, s that tend to have those little um, toroidal steps for the ladder. This is seen in the movies all over the place. It's everywhere. We've got the blue light, usually some sort of a magical light that bursts forth from the ground, shooting all the way up into the sky. The Burj Khalif is also um, shown as being a huge light in the sky, symbolically speaking. I've got many different examples of this. This is a real one. This is a real volcano with a real plasma beam shooting up out of it. <laughs> like, And um, the, the academic explanation for this is that um that's a that's a falling star that came from space and happened to land right in the middle of this volcano yeah i don't think so but anyways uh these are different examples of the blue beam itself this is real life examples of various blue beams that people are starting to see and catch on camera all around the world when chernobyl blew up this is a this is actually a drawing of chernobyl blowing up right um, it's said that a blue beam was seen emitted from Chernobyl and shooting up into the sky. Many different other examples of the blue beam shooting up um, the sky beam, usually hitting some sort of a circle or a hole in the sky in the middle, usually coming from the top of a volcano or an unfinished pyramid. We also have set up our own reminders of this worldwide, right? Um, this one is in some northern lands. I can't remember exactly where right now. Ghost Ghostbusters has a blue beam. Here's a real life image of a blue beam that somebody took. Tron has the blue beam symbolism on the plane of existence. The Fantastic Four, the Bible and the pillars of light. Um, the blue beams that shoot up um, where the, the three become or where the two towers used to be, basically. And they've replaced that with um, two blue beams of light. In uh, the movies, there's various instances that characters are represented, re representative of the blue beam itself. For example, Godzilla, right? Godzilla's got this whitish baby blue beam that shoots up, and he shoots it straight up into the sky sometimes. And he represents that. He Godzilla lives deep down inside of the hollows of the earth, as shown in the movies. Um, this is a new one from Moon Knight. I haven't seen it yet, but it came up in my, my research. It's got a pyramid and uh, plasma shooting up out of the top of the pyramid. This is a real light that people have erected and made that shoots this blue light up into the sky for unknown reasons, right? Um, but I feel like it just resonates with so many people that we see this blue beam symbolism. Here it is in Interstellar. Sometimes it's drawn so that it's not actually a beam, but if you blur your eyes and look at it, you can tell there is a pyramid underneath a blue beam. And then there's like this crescent moon imagery, which is what you will see up there in the sky with the hole in the sky. Blue beam, blue beam, Luxor's blue beam, one of the most famous ones with the black Rupus Negra pyramid. Here's another one. Here's another example. It's also the light of Bethlehem, right? If you if you ever see the images that people draw of the light hovering above where Jesus is born, it's a beam of light that shoots straight down and touches the ground. 
Uh, this one is actually interesting. This is a building that looks like a guitar that shoots a blue light up into the sky. Star Wars symbolism. This is from Indiana Jones. The hole in the sky opens up like we talked about. Uh, this one. What is this one? I'm not sure I remember where, where this one's from. Anyways, it's all blue beam symbolism. And I've come across it with so many different examples. This is Star Trek. Um, the ship makes the eye at the top and then the beam, the beam reaches up to the hole in the sky right at the center. Here's the different blue beams shooting. There's usually a beam in the movie that opens up some sort of a corridor or a portal or something. The beams that shoot up out of the center of the world. All right, I think I have shared that one. Let me just double check to make sure there's nothing else that I missed that I wanted to share. That's from my screen. Okay, that was from the video. Sweet, okay. That's it. I've got to wrap things up. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Um, please do add into the comments if you have any other examples of the blue beam, um, the light of the world, etc. So many different ways to refer to it as. And uh, be positive. Share something, right? Let's, let's not focus on what we disagree on or how we see things different or interpret things differently. Let's talk about what we agree on. Let's build a bridge from where you are to where I am or vice versa. That way we can come together and see the bigger picture. Um, I hate to wrap things up so quickly, but I will be doing a campfire episode. So if you want to continue where we left off tomorrow, join the campfire, call in. Let's talk about Project Bluebeam. And until then, I'm Jay Jamers saying good vibes and goodbye.